this is the 2.5 Conversations Connecting Innovators. My name is Klaus. I'm an innovation coach in Baden-Württemberg in the southwest of Germany. In this episode of the 2.5 Innovator podcast, my guest is Maria Jose Toralde. We are talking about human behavior for change and climate protection actions as a service and so much more. Chuchi, as she is called, is the co-founder of Humans for Abundance, an organization in Ecuador that connects rainforest restorers with coal restorers across the globe. Humans for Abundance brings humans together via an e-commerce platform which allows the easy booking of climate protection actions as a service. The purchase triggers defined actions, supports communities and develops a global understanding of the width of climate change responsibilities and requirements. Check out the 2.5 website for all the links, videos and a transcript at the2.5.net. Enjoy the show. <laughs> Hello again. Hello again. So um, my name is Maria Jose Turralde. Uh, people call me Chochi. It's my nickname and that's the name I use because it's, it's usually easier for people, especially in this kind of work that I'm doing right now for international, uh, for other countries to pronounce Chochi for some reason uh, than just Maria. Maria doesn't feel like a, my identity. Hello, Chochi. Welcome to the 2.5 podcast. Thank you for being with me tonight. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about that conversation that we're having right now because you are in Ecuador. I am in Ecuador. Thank you so much for inviting me to your podcast. I'm delighted. Chochi, in the background, uh, I can see a bookshelf and you collect books or notebooks. What do you do with them? How, how does the, did the collection start? Well, if I see a notebook anywhere in the world when I travel, especially if it's a nice notebook with blank pages, I have to buy it. It's, it's, a, it's an addiction, I think. <laughs> um, my brain just wants to doodle and draw and, um, and put just, just doodle and doodle lines and stuff in drawings. I love drawing. So that's why I have to buy them and I start collecting uh, the notebooks. I also take notes for, for whatever project I'm in, right? So I take the notes while I doodle, sometimes the notes are around the doodles <laughs> and they take this organic form that my brain really understands. Um, so instead of writing in, in regular, like regular <laughs> line paper, on regular line paper, I, I need this blank space, which I don't know, it's open space for thinking for me or for downloading ideas sometimes or for organizing in a different way. So my brain is very much a, a bright side <laughs> driven brain. I, I very much look at the bright, sorry, the, the big picture. Well, the bright picture too, but uh, the, the big picture. <laughs> I need to see the big picture all the time, maybe come back to the details, but then look at the big picture again and come back to the details. So, so doodling um, helps me do that. And, and it's a way for, a medium for me to write down these ideas and maybe connect things that are not seemingly or obviously connected. Um, so yeah. That's a, actually how the project started um, for me, connecting things that are not obviously connected, mm -hmm. I think. I, I was impressed when I first heard about your project uh, in, the, in a BBC documentary. Um, and I was really impressed by the, the broadness uh, of, of what you, you were looking at or dealing with. And I think we have to take our time to, to discover that. But first of all, I have never been to Ecuador, sorry. I don't know much about Ecuador. I have been doing some reading on Ecuador and I was fascinated. I had a look at pictures. It looks very uh, like a very beautiful and interesting co uh, country. Give us an idea, please, of where you are, what your surrounding looks like, uh, what maybe life is in Ecuador for you. First of all, uh, Ecuador is it's a really fascinating country uh, for many reasons. Uh, People usually know it because of the Galapagos Islands. So people think Galapagos Islands are like separate from any from any country, but it actually uh, is part of the Ecuadorian 
of the Ecuador uh, country. So um, we have the Galapagos, which are really, really amazing. But then we have three other, in the continent, we have three other areas, which are well, the coast, the Andes mountains. So we have a range of, of snow-capped mountains, which is where I live. Um, and then the, the, the Amazon rainforest, once you go down the mountains towards Brazil, let's say. So it's a really amazing country. It's a very tiny, but you can be in any of these places that I just mentioned um, in a couple of hours. So after a two hour drive, scenery changes, you know, from, from wetlands in the Andes um, to the Amazon rainforest with these, those huge rivers and uh, huge trees. So it's really, really, really beautiful country um, uh, surrounded by nature. We, I think we are uh, in the top 10, at least of the most mega diverse countries. I don't know if people know this um, in Europe, uh, but yeah, we have, we are a hot spot for biodiversity um, all over from Galapagos to, to the Amazon rainforest, right? So we have a lot of species that are endemic to Ecuador that you cannot find anywhere anywhere else in the in the world. So it's a very very special place, and uh, and yeah, sadly, it's becoming. Um, I wouldn't want to use the word destroyed, but you know we're we're destroying a lot of it. Human human activity, as we know, we're we're taking a lot of resources for other purposes. Yes, I am located in Quito, in the capital of Ecuador. It's a big city. It's a bit con contaminated, but so I chose to live a little bit outside where there's a lot more nature, as you can see in the background. Um, but you can see there is an avocado tree. So um, I'm very happy because I have space to grow my own garden, uh, so my own food. I'm very, very into organic food and, and having a better relationship with, with the soil and the water and not you know, reducing my footprint a lot in, in this way. So my relationship with Mother Earth uh, has changed Im immensely. Well, I, I don't know if it has changed because I've always had this consciousness and this love for, for Earth and for nature since I was a kid. But, you know, as you grow up, you, you become more conscious of, of uh, the things that you do that produce, you know, more contamination, like the, the food that you buy or the clothes that you buy or or I don't know, customs that you might have, how, how much you drive your car, et cetera, et cetera. Like as you become older, you reduce or you're more conscious um, in reducing those things. So, so I've become really passionate about, about reducing and, and um, educating about this. So, so far to my family and my circle of friends, but hopefully we'll be able to do more and more of that uh, national, nationally, how do you say this, at a, at a national level. You live in Quito, which is, or outside of Quito, which is very high up in the mountain. Does that change the way you live? You do sports, for example, or you do things that are physically um, uh, challenging? No, we're, because I was born here, we're born, we, we get used to the altitude. Um, and I mean biologically used to the altitude. So we produce more red cells, I think, in our blood to be able to carry more oxygen. Uh, inside our bodies, which is something that uh, visitors don't have, right? So that's why they feel the altitude so much. I think, I'm not sure about the science about our, uh, behind this, but I think there's a little bit more trouble digesting food or uh, sometimes pregnancy when you, you go high in higher altitudes or sometimes if you have like uh, respiratory diseases and stuff like that, some doctors recommend that you should go You know, live somewhere where it's lower. But for me personally, I am I am very used to Quito. I love Quito because it's a eternal spring weather. My my friends from the U.S. and from other countries uh, tell me that I am a spoiled, <laughs> a weather spoiled person <laughs> because if the, if two or three degrees go up, I'm I'm really hot, and if two or three degrees go down, I'm really really cold. So my range is you know five degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Celsius, I, it needs to be, you know, from, from 15 to 20 degrees Celsius, which is the, the weather like in Quito. So, um, so it's pretty good. Well, thank you. I'm, I, that really helped me uh, to, to sort of better understand uh, where you at and, and oh. get a, a, some, some personal glimpse at Ecuador, which I think is fascinating looking at it from the, from the outside. Uh, you said there is lots of nature there's lots of biodiversity uh in in your country 
And um, I think we should talk about your project now. Uh, you called it Humans for Abundance. And I think this abundance might come from what uh, you, you just said about the, 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 the richness of nature that you have around you and, and maybe the changes for that. I've been surrounded by abundance my whole life, right? Especially in resources and nature and beauty and sounds and, you know, concerts of the forest, because I, I, I love going to the Amazon and um, my, my father used to work there. So I went there since I was a, a little kid. Um, so I've seen how abundant nature is in terms of diversity and, and all these riches that you're talking about. Um, but I also recently was reading a book. Um, I think it's the, the author, I forget, it's Lynn Twist, something like that, which talked, uh, she talked about the soul of money and how um, humans are, look at money and, and uh, and resources and with a scarcity mode, with a scarcity mindset, right? Like if I take resources, they will not be enough for you. Or if you take resources, they will not be enough for me. So we have this scarcity mode that we've been, like all humanity has been in the last, I don't know, 100 years or taking, 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 because we think there's not going to be enough. Um, and, and this lady was saying how, if we change that mindset to, to an abundance, mindset when we think there will be enough for everybody and we'll share it and we'll let those resources that money flow you know as a currency um, then it will help things grow for everybody so and she was uh, she was comparing it to to a river or to water right so when you take money and you hoard it for yourself and uh, just like if you hoard water that water sometimes turns Uh, or rots, right? It becomes like toxic water if you keep it for yourself. But if you if you let it flow, just like money, right? Or resources, if you let them flow, if you share them with with others in the planet, then that water uh, brings life and brings more resources. And nature is very, very good at this. Like I, I can tell you from experience, I bought this house and this piece of land and started planting trees and fruit trees there is enough for me, my family, and many other families, just in this little piece of land where I live, because nature is really, really generous when you give to it, instead of just taking from it. So because we need to, this, we have this need to make money, because we think we're, there's not going to be enough. We use all these resources in a bad way, in a not effective way. So nature cannot produce enough. And that's what we're seeing, right? But if we change our mindset to abundance mindset, we start uh, communicating or having a different relationship with nature, a more biocentric relationship, then we, we will create abundance. That's, that's our perspective and our hope, right? Because we have to be optimistic when it comes to biodiversity loss and climate change. Otherwise, why we're doing this, right? <laughs> But um, we are really optimistic. I am really optimistic because I think human, we are at a point of human nature Where, where our consciousness is changing from scarcity to abundance. Not everybody's there yet, but I can see or I can feel a lot of people changing this mindset and, and people seeing the results of that abundance. So that's why we came up with a name. It's like, all right, humans for abundance. Let's say, let's, let's get all the humans to change their behavior and the mindsets so we all produce abundance for everybody, for everybody, including all other living beings and non-living beings, <laughs> right? Um, uh, so so that's, that's how the name started. The project started because um, I'm an educator and I, I, I took some students to the Amazon rainforest. Um, we did a toxic tour. We, you, can, you can hire someone to do a, do a toxic tour in the Amazon here, which is pretty revealing. Uh, in the sense that the, this tour takes you to the oil rigs, you know, the Ecuador's main um, income or so, source of income is oil. So we export oil to other countries and that's how we pay our, you know, national <laughs> systems. So, so yeah, I went to see these uh, oils, especially um, the ones from a certain company <laughs> that, um, were involved in a legal battle. Um, so you, when you go there, it's just devastating. The, the flares, 
uh, methane and um, natural gas are pouring out to the atmosphere, you know, 24 seven since 45, 50 years ago. And this is the same atmosphere that you, <laughs> that you have, right? You, you don't live in a separate, even though you live in a, in a different country, we share the same atmosphere. And these are the same rivers that go to the ocean that belongs to everybody, right? Um, so a lot of contamination through the rivers because of the pools where they extract samples or so that they, they make a hole in the ground uh, to test if the oil that will come out from that spot will be liquid enough to pipe. Right. So they make all these testing and, and they create pools where and they, they leave it on the open. So animals can fall in these pools that are full of, you know, heavy metals and other contaminants. Um, when it rains and it rains a lot in the Amazon, uh, those pools overflow into the rivers. So all the rivers in the Amazon or a lot of the rivers of the Amazon are very contaminated. Um, they go through the communities, through indigenous communities, which are which have cancer rates at an alarming, <laughs> you know, they're increasing their kind of cancer rates at an alarming pace. And eventually those rivers arrive to the ocean. And, and so, so yeah, it's a pretty big, big problem. It, it broke my heart when I saw this. So we started thinking about, all right, we need to change everything we're doing <laughs> and start a project that, um, mitigate some some of this maybe a little bit but i kept having the feeling that we needed to do something bigger something that if we do something local it might not have enough impact um i don't know why my intuition told me like to go bigger so we started thinking about what we can do what we could do and we came up with this idea of um, making basically becoming a bridge right between the people who have resources uh, who have more knowledge about the ecology and, and climate change and biodiversity law with the people who actually have the land and the time and the knowledge to do it, right? They know how to take care of the forest and the plants that are native from there. Um, they just don't have the resources. So they are pushed to cut those trees, um, uh, to put cattle in their lands, to put a monocrop because that's what the government uh, impulses and promotes, right? Because we're in in countries where our basic needs are not fulfilled by government. So our medicine and, and you know health systems are not great. Our food systems are not great. Our education systems are not great. So people are just trying to, to fulfill basic needs. So there's no way where they can think about climate change and keeping resources and protecting forests. There's they're, that's at like a different level. They need to think first of how they're going to feed their kids. How are they going to send their kids to school? With what money are they going to pay for the, for the medicine that they need to buy? So this is a very different reality. So what we saw is that in our country, in Ecuador, I'm assuming in other countries in Latin America, environmental loss, let's call it, it's very, very linked and interconnected with, with poverty right, with a lack of education and with disorganized systems. So, um, so that's what we saw, like, all right, how do we, how do we create a system, right, for, um, that combines environmental action, which we need desperately, right, because we're losing this hot spot, a spot of my mega diversity, which also includes also Colombia and Brazil and, and you know, other countries of Latin America because of the Amazon rainforest. How do we combine this action that we need to take with social justice, right? So environmental justice should be linked to, to social justice in our view. So you cannot just fix the environment because it's not separate from the people who live it, in, in it and around it. So you can have a project, um, a reforestation project, let's say you plant the trees with all the technology that you want. You, you even shoot seeds from you know, drones and stuff. And then those trees grow. And 20 years later, how do you prevent from uh, humans from cutting those trees? If those humans need to pay for school, I'm not talking 
these are terrible humans, the, the ones that cut trees, right? These are demons who don't care about the environment. No, they need to pay for, for medicine and for food. How else are they going to pay? If one tree in the Amazon can, can give you as much as $3,000, if you cut it for the wood, it would be illegal. Maybe you have to take the wood at night, but there's no other way to do it unless they have a, a, a different source of income. So how are we gonna bring that different source of income? Are we gonna wait for the government to give them a source of income? Are we going to wait for the government to give them an incentive to not cut the trees? Well, I mentioned disorganized systems, right? Um, that money just stays in certain, in certain pockets and it doesn't come down to the people who are actually in the ground taking care of the forest. So, so, so yeah, the, and besides that, people, if the government incentivizes, you know, cattle as a way, a source of income or uh, monocrops as a source of income, and it gives, you know, loans to people and supports that kind of activity because it's good for the country, right? To the economy, that's all they see. Um, then of course, people are gonna take those incentives and do what, what the government says, right? Or of course, they're gonna take whoever that comes their way because of lack of education, they don't, they don't understand ecological, they don't have ecological literacy. We don't have ecological literacy in the city. Uh, I think in Europe, it, ecological literacy started recently, right? But in, Latin, in my country, at least, ecological literacy is non-existent. The majority of people do not understand the interconnectedness of every living being we think we live separately from the ecosystems, right? We don't understand how our food arrives to our plates. We don't, we think it's magic, right? You plant something and then it grows. And it's not, you need you know, a fertile, fertile soil and uh, pollen, pollinizers, how do you say this? Um, pollinators. So, so yeah, it's, it's a circle, a vicious circle that we live in in these countries that it's very much linked to to social injustice or social underrepresentation and social, you know, inequality. So that's how the project started. Just we thought, okay, we can become a bridge, you know. So the people who are in the margins, the people who have the land, can become an active part in in the re restoration of nature. They can become the main subjects and the main heroes, I guess. Um, but they need partners who have act, who actually have the understanding, right? That of why this needs to happen, and uh, who actually have the cash uh, to to move those resources. As as in this mindset of abundance that I, I was telling you before, right? Um, if you move those resources to these people, then more will come back to you in terms of of more biodiversity and carbon sinks and all these things that we need to create urgently, right? So, so that's why we, so the idea came exactly from um, a delivery motorcycle I saw once. And I said, all right, if people who have the resources and the understanding cannot do anything for the Amazon rainforest because they live in Germany and they have a job and they have three kids that go to school, they're not going to move to the Amazon, buy land, you know, and restore the land. They don't even know the Amazon rainforest. They're probably scared of everything that lives there, right? <clears throat> they probably don't want to live, leave their family and, uh, and uh, you know, change their life just to go restore, what, two, three, 20, 50 hectares of rainforest? So, um, but, but people who are in the city, right? They want to do something for the environment, but sometimes they don't, they don't know what to do. They don't have the means to do it. So, you're left with activism, which is really great. And you're left you know, with protests in front of governments and you're left with, with recycling at home and buying a, an electrical car. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, uh, rivers are getting contaminated, you know, which again, land in the ocean. Atmosphere is, very, is being contaminated and, and you know, full of emissions and trees and, and vital ecosystems are being destroyed. So if we could, um, by seeing this delivery delivery motorcycle, um, we we're like, all right, we will just do that. We will we will uh, do the work that they cannot do, right? Because of of these limitations of their city or their location or whatever. But we are located here, so we can do that work for them if we create these partnerships. So that's how the project 
uh, started. Sorry, it was such a long answer. <laughs> I fully understand what you mean. In the in the beginning, I thought, "Wow, that's a cool climate change solution. It's a cool way to or an alternative solution for CO two compensation or CO two reduction." When I first uh, heard about your project or about your business, let's put it that way, and then I found out that it's uh, also this uh, great chance to develop that local community. Um, on both sides, on the side of the people that do the work on their land by, say, reforestation and taking care of the land, and also on the other side, the community is also developed uh, where families, for example, take care of that piece of land far, far away and create some sort of... Uh, global um uh, global understanding or global uh, don't don't remember the name right now um Wait, connection yes there's a connection between group. two families for example or two two people um across uh, the globe w using your solution let's put it that way And, but it's not uh, uh, one of these uh, standard climate change, CO2 reduction uh, uh, things. Um, it's much smarter in a way, I think. And it's less bureaucratic, more direct. More direct, yeah. We bypass um, a few of the systems that are not very well organized, right? And a few of the tr traditional routes, which governments or with people use to interact or exchange things, right? Which are typically, typically government-based uh, or or sometimes NGO based, right? Um, but there's another way, which is business. And sadly, well, um, our world is, is organized around uh, business, right? That we've built highways <laughs> for businesses. Every every government in the, in the world has allowed for businesses to thrive. It's really easy to open a business, right? But sadly, we use business as a force for destruction. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. So, so yeah, we chose to be a social enterprise, which is uh, a, a model that um, I we think it's easier for us to to, or it's a model that would allow us to grow faster. And, and we have this urgency, right, for climate change. We cannot. So being an NGO in Ecuador, it, it will be impossible to get the funds to actually crack, you know, the and and be become really big and create this. Uh, partnerships that we're talking about and at a big scale because we, we're looking for a compounded effect, right? We're looking for millions of families to partner with millions of restorers. So the compounded effect on the environment is huge. But um, so we chose to to go for the for the social entrepreneurship model and we're looking for a B certification. So the B Corporation certification, which is a certification that limits the way we use profits. So yes, we are a for-profit, uh, but we want to use that profit, as, as I said again, to, to let the money flow uh, towards more abundance. So we don't, we're not interested in hoarding money. <laughs> we're interested in letting it flow to create more abundance for everybody. And that's how we see ourselves, right? Like collecting this, this uh, resources and, and redistributing them to people who could very far away from being able to create their own businesses or their own NGOs, right? Uh, who will never understand how to create a PayPal account, right? In the Amazon. So we need to act as these middle ground for, to allow these interactions that will create more abundance. <clears throat> so yeah, as, as you said, we, we chose this model that we think could be scalable, right? Uh, we can we can move to other countries in the global south uh, with our model and find more restorers. And then, uh, thanks to technology, um, the same technology that is allowing us to to chat today, uh, th thanks to that technology, we can look for people on the other side who want to create this impact uh, by using different models, different systems, maybe more effective. You know, the the highway, as I say. So yeah, if we need to take the planet to the ER, <laughs> right? Uh, we think it's a better idea to take it, you know, to take the highway and and the the fast vehicle, and, and not the back road, mm -hmm. uh, and and the and the carriages, horse and carriage that has been, you know, uh, designed or I mean, 
yeah, designed for other kinds of, of models. For example, government routes, you know, those are sometimes very slow because of the disorganized system. So. I was very, very impressed when I saw that you had an online shop for saving the rainforest, for uh, where I could <laughs> order a week of uh, guarding a tree for, and stuff like that. So it's a very, very straightforward process to become a co-restorer, uh, to become one of these partners uh, with um, the people that do the work uh, in, in the forest, for example. I was, I, that's very, very nicely done and it's very straightforward and it's just a different way of shopping. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And it has much <laughs> more sense and much more uh, soul or a positive outcome than shopping cheap clothes, for example, at one of these online stores. So that is, I think, very, very nicely done. Um, so you are connecting at least two sides. And uh, on your website, you're calling these two sides restorers and co-restorers of rainforests and communities. Yes. And uh, I understand that uh, you show these restorers on your website also. Um, so I can sort of get a personal, better personal uh, feeling of, of this person or of this family. But who is restorers and who is co-restorers? Do we have an example? So as you said, as you mentioned, right, we are a human-based project Uh, which an idea to change human behavior, which is the one that's causing the crisis or the climate crisis, right? So we're not per se an environmental, um, we're focused just on environment. We are more human-based, which uh, with a desire to change human behavior for in the benefit of nature, right? So um, so yeah, we, we have selected like specific actions that humans can take to for the environment right so this is what we sell we sell specific actions so you can go in our catalog browse our specific at a specific action right so you know where your money is going it's going to that action specifically and then you'll get a report of that action um, because that's what you're hiring. You're hiring someone to do that job for you because you can't do it, right? So again, this human connection and like supporting, one human supporting another human um, in, the, in this way. So, so yeah, very much, very much a human-based and uh, action-based. So how we see it is that the, the restorers, right, as you were mentioning, The restorers are people who usually have been in positions of disadvantage in terms of not having access to, you know, a city life, right? They live in the countryside. They're usually unattended, underrepresented, um, very colonized in terms of, uh, so, so colonization happened in, you know, in, in the global South um, and, and changed mindsets. So these are people who have a different belief about what they used to be and what they are now. They think they need to become occidental in their ways. They think they, they are less sometimes because that's what they taught us. You know, with the, when the colonies came, they taught us to be less, less important. What you know is less important. So, so we're trying to rescue, well, not rescue, just like show the identity of these people, the underrepresented people, right? Um, that, that have this different relationship with nature. They really understand and they really connect and not just at a physical level, they connect at a spiritual level for them, for these people, um, sometimes a lot of indigenous communities, right? They see the nature as, uh, as a living and breathing um, being and, where, and, and actually where their ancestors live and they can communicate in this way. So our mission is to connect these people Right, that have this different, more biocentric way of life, and and who have been lately um, underrepresented and undervalued, you know, to rescue and um, and show the world that they can be valuable um, actors in this climate, you know, solution database <laughs> or, or 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 methods that we're we're trying to create. So we're trying to con connect those people from the global south who usually live in places um, 
that are, well, we call them vital ecosystems, right? Like the Amazon rainforest. They have the land there, they live there. They don't want to move from there and they have the knowledge with people from the global north um, who have um, a better understanding of climate change, a better understanding of how everything is interconnected and like all the science behind, you know, CO2 uh, and not, yeah, uh, and like why we all the emissions of carbon and like how to create carbon sinks and all the all the science behind it basically. So they they have the understanding, they have the bigger picture. <laughs> So, um, so our idea is to connect those two people, the people who have more access to education, to the science, to the understanding and to the urgency really, to the people who actually uh, need to make another way uh, or need to find another way to make a living that is not taking away their resources. Because they, they've seen, they've seen how after 40 years of cutting their forests and trees, their soil is damaged. They have less water, they have less resources and they're desperate. They're desperate because that's all they have. Their land is all they have sometimes. So these are our restorers and co-restorers. And that's what we want to, to call that that way, like partnership, like collaboration between the two, because the two sides have the two essential pieces that we need to do this work. So, so just to, to add what you said before, it's a different way of seeing nature uh, or doing a, an environmental project because we're not focused on carbon credits or any other way of, of commodifying nature, right? We think nature or natural resources are limited. And once we start trading with them, then we only have limited possibilities. But once you start trading with human actions, then the possibilities are infinite, right? Because humans can take certain actions a million times. <laughs> over and over and over and for uh, an extended period of time. So, so that's why we said like, all right, how, how do we, how do we create a service, you know, mm -hmm. um, where humans uh, take actions in favor of nature and of themselves in the end. Right. So that was, 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 was fascinated me that different approach to the, to that, um, to the same effect, let's put it that way um, with having, much more going on and much more effect than just a, a carbon certificate or whatever you, you could uh, call it. Um, it is actually triggering a positive human result on both sides or on all sides. Yeah, and also a, a really big focus of what we do is uh, education. So this is our guarantee. A lot of people ask me, like, how do I, how do, how do you guarantee that that forest is going to stay there for forever? Like, what legal documents do you have? And I'm like, I, I cannot legally bind anybody <laughs> forever to to do, you know, certain thing on their land. But what I can do is come first bring a different source of income so they feel secure and they can cover their basic needs for medicine and you know food and education. Um, and then I can bring education, which is what changes the mindset, right? So once the mindset is changed, once, once the view and the perspective is bigger, then they decide to change and protect that forest and that land forever. And that's what they teach their kids. So in our experience, that's what's really changing. So when we started the project, we brought money. Basically, we found money with a pilot community. We started paying them to restore Right. So they, they had cut the trees for uh, purposes of agriculture and cattle and and just to sell the wood. And we tell them, all right, uh, you're going to do assisted reforestation or assisted secondary forest uh, restoration. Right. So um, they started doing that. They started finding the seeds. They started um, reproducing the seeds in like a little homemade nursery and they started planting these trees and we we brought scientists to teach them how to do well not just scientists but you see you saw on bbc video omar omar Tello, who is a, an experienced restorer so we brought omar to tell them how to how to be, uh, start this process of of ecological restoration which is to bring the whole ecosystem back to its trajectory to its former trajectory it's not just planting trees it's it's understanding how every, all the biodiversity um, needs basically. <clears throat> so we start bringing the money, and of course that brings a change in behavior, right? People instead of 
throwing chemicals in, in the soil and the plants, they started planting and taking care of the soil, making organic fertilizers, right? Mm -hmm. So because we brought workshops and we brought, you know, uh, people who knew how to do the restoration and we, we brought this education on ecological literacy, we show them how the soil was alive and how it was dying because of certain practices. And so they started to understand how they themselves had destroyed the chances of survival of, the, of their same community. And that clicked. And we have five restorers right now in our, uh, in, from that community in our website, but 12 of them are doing restoration. And this is the power of education, right? So because we, our workshops are free for any, everybody to come join that then the people start understanding why they need to take care of that forest and that tree and why that tree is so important for that ecosystem. Um, so education is a very, very big focus and it's our guarantee <laughs> that that forest will stay alive for the next generations and not only alive, but producing food and medicine and, and maybe some extra resources for the people to, to make a living uh, and to have enough you know, enough food to feed their, their kids and grandkids, enough medicine from the same forest. So, um, so, so their health is great because of the way they eat and the organic things they eat, plus the other medicinal plants and things that they have there. Um, so that, that will be covered. And then um, uh, they can have some extra resources to sell or to trade for, you know, some extra stuff to pay for the internet and stuff because they all want to be as well as, as the other humans, they all want to be connected uh, and learning. So, so education is a big, big focus in our project. Uh, it's what we're mo most proud of and it's what we've seen has the biggest impact. Um, the, so as you know, the, the problem is in the areas like this and in countries like this that are disorganized, education doesn't come in a timely manner <laughs> or at the level that we want, uh, that we need it at this level. And as I, again, as I said, we were, this is an urgent, urgent crisis that we're experiencing. So. Uh, and you're talking, you're calling that the, on your website the, the triple impact. Um, I will put the, the text on, on the show notes also because I think it that makes very much sense. It, uh, it explains everything in three sentences and that's very helpful for people to understand what you're doing. So you start... You started with a a community, a single community, and I, what I was wondering about is: is for you, uh, is there a a limit of how many communities you could integrate into your system? Um, is there there a limit, say geographically, or what is your vision about that? As I was saying, we want to grow responsibly. That's our vision. Because there are so many communities that want to join uh, and want to have a different source of income. And they don't, as I was saying before, they're not evil human beings who want to, to destroy the forest. They, the majority of the, the communities are people who, whose ancestors lived there for many generations and they want to keep it. And they're sad to see it go, uh, go but they're forced into this capitalistic system, <laughs> right? Um, so they want to keep it. Um, so there's a lot of communities that, or, or just regular, you know, one per, it could be one person or maybe NGOs that want to join as restorers, but we want to grow, uh, we, we don't want to promise them, you know, that they will have a source of income if we don't have enough people from the other side, the other side of the puzzle, right, uh, bringing in the resources. So we take, a, we take just a very small fee for this transaction, that's our model. Um, so the majority of the money goes to the restore. So as if we have more, more money coming through from, from this side and more resources, then we can uh, increase the number of communities and, and restores. But we're beginning in the, in the Amazon rainforest right now for, uh, because we need to use res resources to verify. Um, that's another service that we, we do, right? We verify that they're actually doing the work that they that we say they're doing. We verify, we go there, we see if they're planting. We, we are constantly in communication and we also monitor the forests scientifically. And we're gonna begin monitoring the forest from the satellite, uh, thanks to a partnership that we're, that we're doing with Restore, um, a Swiss company <laughs> that will start using Google Earth 
satellite the, uh, images to to check on on these projects basically no limits because technology will help you um, to do the controlling thing and there's lots of interest in being part of your system of your movement of your of your company basically how do you tackle the other side um, of getting people on the north involved in in your project well yeah that's the challenge right um so, so yeah, as you said, we there's ways that we can grow and, and move to different ecosystems here in Ecuador uh, once we have more resources. But how do you get those resources <laughs> from the other side? So, so right now, yeah, we're we're looking, we're putting together a, a plan to grow and scale up uh, our business. So we we need uh, basically right now investors. We're looking for investors um, uh, who will help us become better known because you know how much uh, investment you have to do in this ocean of virtual social media and and how difficult it is for small organizations to you know access <laughs> or to let to let other people know about them in this huge ocean of so many other things so there's so many services and so many um, institutions and, and products and everything so the competition is fierce so right now we're looking for uh, to grow in that way as a regular uh, social enterprise, looking for an investor who will, uh, until we can make enough sales and until we find all those people from the north and to be self-sustainable. So this uh, they can help us uh, promote what we're doing. So basically, yeah, invest investing and hopefully PR and hopefully people like you who help who help us spread the message and the idea. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's our plan. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I really recommend looking at your website because the way you show your vision and your mission statement, you show the services, you show the people behind the project, uh, is outstanding, I think. And it's a great example of good e-commerce. And that sounds weird maybe in that context, but, um, Using the internet, using a website, using an online shop to do something very human is just such a smart thing to do because it is accessible from everywhere around the world. So it, it, it's, I think your, your enterprise is also a good example of uh, something, a global e-commerce business. Even you might not like that, uh, but I think it is. And it's very well done also. Very, very, it looks nice. It's very easy to use and uh, heads up uh, to your web designer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, well, uh, as you might know, we're, we're in the beginning of the, the process of growth of this enterprise and uh, hopefully we'll go into a much better platform or can design a much better platform um, and you know, just with better design and with more features, just like a typical e-commerce or an, an app that's easier or that has more features. So that's our dream too, right? To glow in the technological side of things. So maybe we can have more languages and more um, currencies, right? Because right now we, we were limited by the technology that we use um, by a lot of things. So, so yeah, that's our dream too, to grow. So this is our beta are better products. We're happy to hear fee uh, feedback from people who are listening. We are open to listening to where the problems are <laughs> so we can fix them and grow and have a, a, a much better experience for, for our users. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but our idea is just to facilitate the, uh, the connection between those two worlds who are un until recently disconnected, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you're providing a system change. You're building new ways to fight climate change. Uh, you are sort of strengthening uh, a global sense of urgency and you're providing solutions uh, to solve climate change. Um, you are providing <coughs> global partnerships um, and you do a, you offer a, a design for a better future for the people doing the restoring work. And also the co-restorers. And sort of, you do things very different than normal. 
Um, <laughs> you're laughing right now. <laughs> Yeah. So that's normal for you to do things that are not normal. It is actually. It is. Um, that's one of my characteristics as a, as an innovator, or as a, a as an entrepreneur. I think I, for some reason, I don't like that much to do things in the normal way, as you said. I I love to innovate and think uh, think of things that I have never never done before. Uh, that gives me a sense of of. Oh, <laughs> and and pleasure. My brain is very good at connecting things that are not connecting uh, and that are not obviously connected. So to be able to create these new things or uh, out of the normal things, right? And like new ways and new paths, that's always something that's driven everything I do. So even in the classroom, when I was a teacher, Um, I, I didn't like following just the regular, typical, you know, lessons that um, that I had when I was a kid. I, I was always innovating and trying new things and reading about and like connecting things and, and applying them in a different way. So, so yeah, uh, this idea is that is is the result of thinking in a new way or connecting. Uh, this e-commerce that is so huge in the world right now with Amazon and these other platforms, uh, it already exists. Um, and we're already shopping and we're, we're crazy about shopping. <laughs> There's a lot of people who spend hours in the internet shopping, as you said, right? Uh, it's kind of, it's sort of like a, a human need to, to um, I don't know, for entertainment, I assume, <laughs> this shopping. It, it, so we're, we're achieving those, those, uh, connections and those gaps that people like to do. But what we found, found um, in most of our life, especially because I'm a teacher, we I know that humans like to help each other. This is one of our biggest traits. And that's why we chose this way. It's like, all right, let's use this technology for e-commerce that already exists, right? To connect people who want to help each other. So uh, the mot motivation is there. And this is also the triple impact. It's not only that I'm helping a person or a family, And I'm helping myself, right? I'm helping the environment as well, which is what we need to do urgently right now. So, so that's why we thought it was a, a good connection to make or a, let's get out of the normal. Sometimes, you know, our brains tend, tend to think like if we have an environmental problem, let's solve it from an environmental um, way or a point of view. Let's start planting more trees. Let's start, you know, protecting more forests. Let's start decontaminating rivers, we let's start doing all these things. But what's the source behind that contamination <laughs> and that, um, you know, uh, that, that those terrible things for the environment? What's the source? What's causing it? And it's humans, human behavior. So what we need to tackle is the, co the cause of these problems. And then nature will solve itself. It, it, it will repair itself faster than any human can do it with any technology. So we just need to get out of the way and and, um, and just help each other become more stable, more happier, you know, uh, and in this abundance mode. And then nature will, will take care of itself and will actually take care of us as well <laughs> with all these resources. So that's how we see it. Dear Chochi, thank you very much for being an innovator and taking the time for this conversation. No problem. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. That was my conversation with Chochi from Humans for Abundance in Ecuador. Check out the 2.5 website for all the links, videos and a transcript at the2.5.net. In the 2.5 podcast, innovators from around the globe share the highs and lows of an innovator's life, their motivation and creative passions, as well as their favorite methods, tools and ideas. The 2.5 Conversations Connecting Innovators podcast is hosted in Baden-Württemberg in the southwest of Germany by me, innovation coach Klaus Reichert. This is the 2.5.